Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Rich Weiner, and I'm a professor at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln in the Law and Psychology program. Um, and I'm going to be spending some time next hour talking to you about some research that we've been doing, um, looking at a variety of different programs in Nebraska probation, juvenile probation. Before I start, I want to let you know that if you want to mute your phone, I'm told you can do that uh, by star six on most phones. And um, you should also, should also see that on the right-hand corner of your screen, uh, there are some files, PDF files that are set up. And those files um, contain pretty much all the material I'm going to be talking about uh, this afternoon. So if you want to download those to take a look at those files, feel free to do so. So once again, my name is Rich Weiner, and I'm a faculty member at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Um, and I've been, for the last several years, doing research and evaluation work with, the, uh, with Nebraska probation. Um, first, we did quite a bit of work with the adult side of probation, but the last couple years we've focused a lot of attention um, on juvenile probation. And what I really want to do this afternoon is fill you in, give you an update about the kinds of things we've been doing and the kinds of things that we've been, we've been finding, uh, specifically with regard, regard to uh, predicting risk and also with regard to recidivism. So before I launch into all the data and um, logic of all the analyses I want, that we're going to be talking about, I want to begin with a bit of an update or background information uh, on criminal justice more generally, which I expect many of you, I see there's a lot of probation officers and people from probation online, I suspect that many of you are familiar with this material, so please bear with me while I, while I catch up and so that we're all <clears throat> really in the same place. <clears throat> so um, what I'm going to largely talk about this afternoon more generally is the risk, need, responsitivity uh, formula for, for looking at rehabilitation and improving quality of life and improving safety for individuals who are um, offenders and who are on, on probation in some capacity. Um, the risk need responsitivity model was developed and uh, back in the 1990s. The most recent really um, publication that talks about it is this one on the screen from Andrews and Bonta in 2010 who interestingly are two Canadian psychologists, not really criminologists at all. Um, but their approach is to understand risk by looking at criminogenic needs. Um, and then once you understand the risk and the need, uh, then the model would suggest to intervene through techniques that are evidence-based, meaning that we have data that suggests that they work, and that are tailored to the characteristics of the individual offender um, that appeal to the way that offender learns and responds uh, to the world surrounding him or her. So we're going to be talking a bit about the risk-need responsitivity model, or R&R, &R, um, which has been applied in a lot of areas in criminal justice uh, and certainly to um, uh, youth in the juvenile justice system to uh, reduce recidivism um, and increase successful outcomes in, in probation and other areas in, in criminal justice. And so on the bottom of the screen are a series of articles uh, that are done by Andrews and colleagues and some others that really show that the R&R &R model has been successful when it's used with youth in the juvenile justice system. So that's really why we're focusing in on that approach. Um, at the core, the center of the R&R &R model is this risk principle, which basically says that one wants to match the level of intervention with the level of risk so that high-risk offenders should receive stronger doses of intervention, while low-risk offenders should receive minimal or no in intervention at all. Um, and so that's the goal, and that's what we're trying to accomplish with um, the R&R &R model. But in order to accomplish that goal, one needs to have a reliable, valid, and fair measure of risk of recidivism to be able to begin uh, that matching process. Um, I should say that um, I should have said this earlier, but at the end of this presentation, there will be some time for people to type in questions in the chat box, and I'll pick them up um, at that time and see if I can answer questions that you have. Getting back to the risk principle, um, in order to have a fair and uh, reliable and valid measure of risk, we have to think about what we mean by uh, recidivism and the assessment of recidivism. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about the assessment of risk and recidivism in youth. So uh, in Nebraska, the juvenile probation 
uh, system and other areas of, that offer support for juvenile work in the juvenile justice system rely on the YLS CMI for its evaluation of uh, an assessment of risk and recidivism. The YLS CMI is a prediction of risk measure um, that looks at criminogenic needs, as I was previously talking about, uh, as they occur in youth. And so um, this is it, the Youth Level of Service Case Management Inventory. It's administered by in Nebraska probation officers in semi-structured interviews in which they ask a series of questions that are scripted based upon the protocol of the model um, in 60 to 90 minute interview sessions. And um, as they ask the questions, they score the answers that the youth provide to the questions. And in the end, that provides a score, overall score from zero to 42. Now, um, when the instrument was first developed, uh, its authors, Hogue et al, um, actually intended or started out looking at it having three levels of risk, low, moderate, and high risk. And so these scores from zero to 42 can be clustered or separated into those three levels of risk. And as we'll talk about in a few minutes, there are other systems or other ways of looking at the YLS, including one that Nebraska probation currently uses. But let me tell you a little bit about the YLS CMI first before we launch into more of the detailed information. It consists of these eight criminogenic need domains that are measured um, on a series of binary items, yes or no. Um, they are prior and current offenses, family circumstances and parenting, education and employment, peer relations, substance abuse, leisure and recreation, uh, personality and behavior, and then attitudes and orientation. So that youth can have risk areas and riskful behavior in any one of these possible domains. Um, all of them, except for the one in red, prior and current offenses, are uh, dynamic factors. So they can change over the period of time in the course while the youth is in probation or after probation or before probation. But prior and current offenses, one of the major predictors, uh, is in fact a static factor that it's not going to change. Nonetheless, the YLS measures overall risk by um, getting scores, by measuring scores for the youth on all of these eight domains that are part of the instrument. And so I mentioned before uh, that while the people that have designed the instrument have used it as the three levels of risk, low, moderate, and high, um, other people that use it have in fact used slightly different systems, including um, Nebraska probation, which divides the youth scores into five levels. And we'll talk more about what those levels are and where they are on the scale in a few minutes. But for now, the five levels are low risk, low moderate, high moderate, high, and very high risk. So at the end, when the youth finishes the interview and the officer scores the, um, uh, the scores that the, that the youth presented, the youth gets classified into one of these levels based upon the scores in each of those eight, the total scores in each of those eight dimensions that I previously mentioned to you. And so in order to understand something about whether or not um, the YLS CMI is a good indicator of risk, and if it is a good indicator of risk, then we are justified in using it in the R&R &R model. If it's not, then we need to know about that and take, take uh, necessary steps to do something different. But in order to know whether the YLS is in fact a good indicator of risk, there's two questions that we want to ask in a research capacity. And they're both printed here on your screen. The first one is, does the YLS CMI administered by Nebraska probation measure risk in it as well as it does in other states and in other countries? Um, and so that's the first question. How well are we doing when we measure risk? What does it look like compared to other people that use the YLS? And the second question is, and this is equally as important in many regards, are there differences in the YLS CMI scores related to gender and minority status? Because in fact, if the YLS works differently for boys than it does for girls, or if it works differently for blacks and Latinos than it does for whites and other, other uh, social status people, uh, then that can suggest that there is some disparate um, impact going on uh, which can cause lots of problems, including some possible, sometimes, um, uh, legal issues that come into play. So, um, before I answer those two questions, I have to take you on a little bit of a statistical cruise here. This is sort of like uh, Statistics 101, 
Um, and I'm going to do it very conceptually. We're going to talk about some basic concepts in statistical validation so that when I start talking about the actual data that we've collected and um, describe it to you, you'll be able to understand what it is that we've done and, and why we did it. So I'm going to talk about these four concepts, once again, at a very conceptual, non-mathematical level, and they are predictive validity, um, effect size, statistical significance, and um, meta-analysis. So we'll t I'm going to talk about those one at a time and try to do it in a way that is understandable and clear for everybody. So first of all, the first concept is this notion of predictive validity. And that's really what we're looking for. Um, and the instrument, or a measurement device, has predictive validity if the underlying construct that it purports tries to measure, uh, it does so with minimal error. And so for the YLS, uh, we're asking the question, does the YLS measure risk of recidivism? And that means, does it, risk, does it measure failure or sometimes committing future violations? And so the higher levels that you scores on the, on, on the YLS, the higher levels of risk, that should be associated with higher rates of failure, and lower scores should be associated with lower rates of failure. So that's ultimately what we're looking for and what we're trying to, trying to um, establish whether or not that's true. Um, and the way that we measure predictive validity in the social sciences and certainly in, in psychology is by looking at effect sizes. And so the effect size is concerned with the strength of the relationship between the predictor, in this case the YLS, and the outcome, in which, as I said just a few minutes ago, is failure. And um, the way we measure it is with, through an R statistic, a point serial correlation, that ranges from negative 1 to positive 1. The sign, the negative or the, or the, or the positive, indicates the direction of the relationship. Um, for the current presentation, it's always going to be positive because we are trying to show or we're measuring and trying to demonstrate that increases in YLS scores are associated with increases in failure. And so we want to have a positive sign um, on that um, effect size. And then the absolute value of the effect size between 0 and 1 measures the strength of the relationship, in this case between the YLS and our outcome, um, which is failure. So before I launch into discussing what we did and what we found, it's important to have an understanding of what effect sizes mean. And I want to give you a more conceptual understanding rather than a statistical or mathematical understanding. So this is a common example. Um, on table one, you can see in the far left-hand corner, we have smoking level. This is cigarette smoking and lung cancer, its relationship. And we have smoking level over 20 years. It ranges from you know, relatively low one to nine cigarettes a day, uh, moving up the scale of 10 to 15, 16 to 20, and eventually somebody is smoking 35 plus cigarettes a day. Um, and then in the far right column, uh, we have the cancer probability level for that group of individuals, depending upon how many cigarettes they smoke. Um, and that ranges from seven at the low level, none, up to 68 for the 35 plus cigarettes a day. And so that's a common relationship that we're all familiar with, and we all know that cigarette smoking is bad for your health. This is an uh, effect size of R equals 0 0.40. The data that you're looking at in the screen would produce an uh, effect size of 0 0.40. Um, so, and to give you even more of an understanding of the way effect sizes pan out, here are some other common effect sizes that people talk about that have been observed in the literature. In this table, on the far left-hand side is the independent variable that we're looking at. In the middle column is the dependent variable, and the, and the far right is the effect size uh, measured in terms of the R value. And as you can see, for example, the relationship between aspirin and preventing heart attack has an effect size of 0.52. Psychotherapy and improving mental health shows an overall effect size of about 0.38. Um, and the adult instrument measuring risk, the LSCMI, which we studied previously, uh, relates to recidivism, in this case returning to probation, with an effect size of 0.22. Now those are all statistically significant, which I will talk about here in the next slide in a few minutes, but they're all meaningful relationships. One at the bottom that's in gray, uh, the relationship between ESP and reading minds is not significant, and it has a small effect size of 0.10. 
So we could question whether or not there really is a relationship between ESP and mind reading, as people have done in, in several studies. So those are some general effect sizes that we work with to give you an idea of what's a large effect and what's a small effect. Overall, an R value of 0.20 is medium-sized effect. Um, R values rarely in research exceed a level of R is equal to 0 0.50. Okay, and then finally, here's a concept that you're probably all very familiar with, but just in case not, we'll spend a few minutes reviewing it. And that is um, from your way back in your undergraduate uh, statistic classes, uh, statistical significance. Statistical significance is the probability of obtaining an effect size, right, between a predictor on one side and an outcome on the other side that's greater than zero by chance alone. So we want this to be really small. We want the probability of getting the effect that we got uh, to be due to chance to be very close to zero, as small as possible. And so um, in statistics, we use these tests of significance you've probably heard of. Some examples are the t-test, the f-test, chi-squared, the Wald statistic, which calculates uh, statistical significance for us so we can, we can document what is the likelihood, what is the probability of getting the effect that we got um, at a level uh, greater than chance. We accept the finding as real in the sciences, in the social sciences and in the physical sciences as well, if the probability of obtaining that result by chance is less than 5 out of 100. And so that's the famous P is less than 0.05. If we get an effect size where the probability of getting that result by chance is less than 5 times out of 100 that that would happen, then we feel that that's a real result and we're justified in going on and, and talking about it and describing it in more detail. Um, and then so finally we need to talk about one more statistical concept and that's a meta-analysis. And this has become a really uh, important tool um, in the sciences in the last uh, 15 or so years. Um, and basically what a meta-analysis is, is it's a study of studies. It's a quantitative review of a large number of studies that summarize the re effect sizes in all of those studies. It tests the relationship between, in our case, let's say, a set of predictors, for example, the scales on the YLS on the one side, with outcomes, uh, recidivism on the other side. And so we want to know across all these studies, there could have been 15, there could have been 100, there could have been 2,000, depending upon the area. Um, we'd like to know what is the relationship across all those studies between the predictor and the outcome, here between the YLS score um, and recidivism. And so that's an important concept that, in fact, um, is what we're going to start with when I tell you about this first study, which is validating the uh, YLS CMI in Nebraska. Now, armed with those concepts uh, and those understandings of the statistical concepts, we can move on and talk about the research that we did here in Nebraska. And so I said I was going to start with a meta-analysis, and this is one that I really want to spend a minute or two talking about. This is a meta-analysis done by Oliver Stockdale and Wormuth in 2014. Um, pretty recent, but uh, you know, starting to get a little bit older, there might be additional studies to include in it. But at the time that they did this in 2014, there were 36 studies of the YLS scales that were done, studies that looked at the effect of predictors and outcomes worldwide. Overall, the effect size between the YLS, um, YLS CMI, and uh, recidivism outcomes defined broadly was 0.25. Uh, in Canada, that effect size was 0.33. And part of the reason why it's so high in Canada is once again because the instrument was developed there and normed there. Um, the other reason is because uh, it's a smaller place and it's easier, smaller in terms of population, it's easier to do um, research in Canada than it is in some other places. Outside North America, where YLS is also used in, in Europe and in Australia and some places in South America, the effect size was 0.28 overall across those studies. And in the United States, where the YLS is used broadly, that effect size is um, 0.22. So that gives us an idea of the kinds of effect sizes that we're looking for in the studies that we're, that we're conducting to see whether or not the YLS predicts the way it's supposed to in juvenile justice in Nebraska. So here's what we did. 
Um, the UNL team analyzed data from 6,158 juvenile probationers who had an index YLS score administered between May 2007 and November 2015. Well, that's a lot of data. It's a lot of kids um, for whom we received information or data from uh, Nebraska probation, and we analyzed that data to answer those two questions that I put up earlier. Does the YLS um, predict outcomes validly? and does it do so without uh, discrimination against uh, different social classes of individuals. So this to give you an idea of what our sample looked like, and hopefully if you have some contact with uh, youth in the juvenile justice system, this will ring true to you. The median age is about 15.5 years, excuse me, the mean age. The median age was 16 years, and as you can see, the sample was 64% boys and 35, 36% girls. So that's, you know, the, the breakdown of the, of the kids that we're, that we're looking at. As you can see here on this current slide, it was mostly a white sample, but with a good smattering of um, minority students, excuse me, minority youth involved, 22% uh, African American, 19% Hispanic, and then smaller groups of American Indian, Asian Pacific Islanders, and others in the sample. Um, and this is a distribution of the YLS scores across that whole sample. On the y-axis is frequency, on the x-axis is the actual score from the first YLS administration, and you know you can see that the mean score overall across the 6,152 youth that we had data for uh, has a mean of about 13, 12.99, which is in the moderate, low moderate range of risk, and you can see it's a nice bell-shaped distribution, nice normal curve which makes researchers you know, very happy and giggle uh, because there's a lot more we can do with data that's normally distributed than data that's, um, that's not. So that's what, what the data looks like on the YLS scores. Um, as I mentioned before, Nebraska probation uses a five level of risk, low risk, low moderate, high moderate, high and very high risk. In our sample, this is a distribution of scores across four of those levels. You can see that the highest scoring group was the low moderate risk with 40% and that it begins to taper off on both sides uh, to low risk, to high moderate risk, and then ultimately to high and very high risk. Now in our analyses, we had to collapse between high and very high risk. That's the last category um, as you look at the screen out to the right uh, because we only had 455 youth that were in that high and very high risk category reflective of the fact that most of the youth in the system are not that high risk. Um, we really didn't have enough data to, to break it out into the five levels that probation normally uses, so we used this four-level classification system um, to be able to do the analyses that we are wanting to do. So, before I can tell you about our findings, remember I said that the purpose of this research is to look at the relationship between the predictors on the one side, that is the YLS scores, and the outcomes on the other side, which in this case um, is failure in probation. And so what we did is we scored a success zero and a failure one because we're predicting failure. Um, success means the youth completed probation successfully and did not return to probation. So that's a pretty rigorous definition of what we mean by success, which means failure is the youth did not complete probation successfully and or return to probation. Now, there's lots of ways you can think about success and failure, and if you download the papers that are on the right, you'll see that we looked at success and failure in a lot of different ways, um, but this is the one that's most rigorous, probably most closely reflects what's been done in other studies, and it certainly is the one that we're going to talk about here uh, this afternoon in, in the rest of this presentation. And so here it is. This is the outcome. Um, this is what you've hopefully been waiting for. This is the probability of failure. If you look on the y-axis, we have the mean predicted probability ranging from 0 to 1. And um, on the x-axis, we have those four categories of YLS risk level, low, low moderate, high moderate, high, and very high. And you can see that this is a statistically significant relationship between the x and y-axis, as indicated by the chi-square up in the top on the right, that is, shows that the significance level is less than 1 um, in a thousand, meaning that the likelihood of this result occurring by chance is less than one in a thousand. Now, if you look at the nature of the relationship, it shows you that as risk level on the YLS goes up, 
from low to high and very high, so does the mean predicted probability of failure from 0.30 at the very low levels to 0.45 at low and moderate, 0.61, and then finally to 0.68 at the high and very high levels. And the sample sizes in of the number of youth in those categories is in the, um, in the n equals in the bars on the graph. So this is the kind of relationship that we're looking for. This is exactly what we really need to find, showing that as YLS risk category increases, so does the mean probability of failure. And for this model, you can see that we found the R for the continuous measure to be 0.29. That's the effect size. So if you think back, um, and if you've downloaded the, um, the, the paper, you can go back and look and see that the overall effect uh, worldwide between the YLS and failure was, um, I believe, 0.25. And in the United States, the overall uh, effect between the YLS and failure was 0.22. So this is a statistically significant relationship between YLS and predicted level of failure, showing it's doing a good job of measuring risk. It's in the same direction, and the effect size um, is moderate uh, and, and, and favorably compares to effect sizes done in studies elsewhere in the United States. So this is my little cartoon with uh, Mighty Mouse indicating that, yeah, this is very good. We're excited to find those effect sizes, and that was a, a good outcome. Okay, so um, I want to move on and talk about the second question, which is the differences in failure um, for uh, uh, by gender um, and also by minority or social status. And so the first question is, does the YLS predict differently for boys versus girls? And if it does, if it behaves differently for boys than it does for girls, that's an issue of concern because we want to be able to use it when we're trying to understand what's the best strategy for, for working with both boys and girls. If it predicts better for one um, gender than the other, then that could be a serious problem. We do find that boys show a higher likelihood to fail or return to probation than do girls. Okay, we do find that, which we call a main effect in, in research. But the YLS, as it turns out, is just as valid, just as accurate at predicting recidivism for boys as it is for girls. And the next slide will show you exactly what I mean by that. And so this uh, slide shows you um, the... Once again, the relationship between scores on the YLS um, on the x-axis ranging from low to moderate to high moderate to high and very high, and once again, the probability of failure on the y-axis going from zero to, you know, one. Um, and so this gives the mean probability of failure for boys and girls at each YLS risk level. And as you can see, first of all, boys do have a higher level of risk of failure than do girls, and that difference uh, the blue versus the pink bars, is actually statistically significant. And that is an effect that we've observed. More importantly, for our purposes, notice that the pattern for boys, increasing from low to moderate to high moderate to high and very high, is the same as it is for girls. That same step function, as you go up from low to um, high and very high risk level, on the YLS, you increase the probability of failure. So that's exactly what we're looking for. Had we found that for one of the agendas, say, for example, for girls, that pink line was flat or it went down, and for the other gender, say, for example, boys, it went up, that would be a serious problem for the instrument. But the fact that we get the same pattern, um, and in fact there is not a statistically significant interaction between YLS and gender, indicates that the instrument can be used just as well for boys as it does for girls. But... Gender issues are one thing. Race and ethnicity can be a whole different category. And, and we, we are very concerned. We want to make sure that the instrument that we're using predicts the same for uh, white youth as it does for black youth and Latino and Hispanic youth. Otherwise, we have a problem um, being able to use the instrument for, for children of, of all ethnic and racial backgrounds. So what we found out is that in Nebraska, the overall probation failure rates is not different for white, black, or Hispanic youth, as I'll show you in a minute. And furthermore, more importantly, in Nebraska, the YLS predicts failure in probation equally well for white, black, and for um, Hispanic youth, as the following um, slide will show you. And so this is the probability of failure, uh, looking at um, 
low, moderate, high, moderate, high, and very high youth from white, black, and Hispanic backgrounds. And you can see um, that we have the same step function for the white youth, the black youth, and the Hispanic youth as we had before. With increases in risk, we have increases in probability of failure. Um, and so that shows that the instrument, um, the way it's being used in Nebraska, and that doesn't mean it's necessarily being, being used, that doesn't mean that we're going to find the same results in another jurisdiction, but in Nebraska, that instrument is producing across the board the same kinds of predictions for white youth as it does for black youth and Hispanic youth. So, what are the take-home points that we can pick up from, um, from this first study? First of all, the YLS CMI, as Nebraska probation uh, officers administer it, is a valid predictor of risk using a current methodology of looking at predictive validity for the instrument. The effect size that we found, 0.29, of the YLS in Nebraska in predicting risk, once again, failure in probation, in probation or return to probation, is greater than most in the United States, well above um, the 0.22 average. Thirdly, the YLS CMI predicts equally well for boys, girls, whites, blacks, and Hispanics. I should point out that we didn't have enough data to look at its predictive validity um, and some of the other ethnic groups, ethnic and racial groups for who we had too few youth to be able to test out um, those, those relationships. Further, um, the YLS CMI bottom line, the take home point that, that um, I hope that you all understand after hearing me talk about this today and reading um, the reports that you have online. The YLS CMI will do a better job of assessing risk then will the experts unaided by a standardized risk measure. That is, professionals working in the juvenile justice system in Nebraska should feel comfortable relying on the YLS for the best estimate of the youth's likelihood to engage in further criminal conduct, how at risk that youth is, and what risk level that youth presents. So that's what that study um, basically tells us. And once again, I think I'm going to wait uh, till the end of the second study and then open up the discussion for questions about the first study or the second study. Um, so the next thing I want to take on is our, our second study that we conducted with the uh, youth in Nebraska. <clears throat> and this generally asks the question, well, how well does the R&R &R model work in Nebraska? I mentioned before that this is the model that uh, um, Nebraska probation, uh, juvenile probation uses. It's also the model that Nebraska adult probation uses. And the question is, how well does that model work here in Nebraska? And so I want to tell you about a second study that we did that tried to answer that question by looking at recidivism in juvenile probation. What is the level? What is the rate? How does it compare to other jurisdictions? And more importantly, how does it compare? How does it change over time? And so we have to start off by asking the question, what is recidivism? How do we measure recidivism? And as it turns out, that's actually a very complicated and tricky issue because definitions of recidivism vary across jurisdictions. They're different for different researchers. They're different for different criminologists. They're different from anybody or many people who study this area or think about the area uh, from an empirical side or a legal side or a social service side. It depends upon legal action. Are we talking about conviction? Are we talking about arrest? Are we talking about incarceration? It varies by type of violation. Are we talking about misdemeanors or felonies or status offenses or what have you? <clears throat> um, it can vary according to the seriousness of the violation. It can vary according to the harmfulness of the outcomes. And it can vary according to how much time we follow um, uh, both youth and adults, depending upon the study, uh, after release. How much time do we follow them before we're willing to say they have or have not uh, engaged in, in recidivism, had another act of criminal offense. Nonetheless, it is true that um, we have some data that we can look at to give us a starting point to look at what would be a high level, low level, what have you, of recidivism. So this is a study from the Michigan Youth Violence Prevention Center completed in 2006. It defined recidivism as re-adjudication or re slash reconviction in the juvenile and or adult systems within one year of release for these youth across these eight states, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, and so on. You can read them on the screen. Um, and so they found in that study about, well, they found a 
level of recidivism. 33% of their youth that they studied recidivated in that study across those eight states. Still, this is a warning, beware. It's difficult to compare recidivism rates between jurisdictions because, once again, different jurisdictions, even the eight on that screen, define them slightly differently. And so when we compare them, it is a bit like comparing ap apples and oranges. In that regard, it's probably much more meaningful to compare recidivism over time using the same definition within a jurisdiction. And we want to know, is it growing? Is it getting larger? Is it staying the same? Or hopefully it's shrinking somewhat. And that is a, probably a better indicator of whether the R&R &R model is working in um, reducing recidivism than is comparisons uh, between states. Okay, so we had to come up with some definition to use to define recidivism for our study of juvenile probation. And it, of course, makes sense and is natural that we would use the Nebraska Supreme Court definition of recidivism because that, of course, is the official definition that um, is used in, in courts and other, in other places in the state of Nebraska. And so in that uh, definition, juvenile recidivism means the following. It means that within one year of being successfully released from probation or a problem-solving court, and I'm going to go back to that successful in a minute. That's why it's underlined in red. Um, there is an adjudication pursuant to Nebraska statute uh, where there is a misdemeanor or infraction under Nebraska law, um, which accepts, accepting, not including misdemeanors for traffic offenses, but does include um, misdemeanor Ws or DUIs, driving while under the influence, or any felony under Nebraska law, um, these are for youth, or any parallel adjudication in the adult system. So that's what we're tracking, and that's what we're looking for, for the most part, when we're looking at um, our definition of juvenile recidivism in the study that follows. Um, so let me go back to that for a minute. Um, the issue here, why I have successfully underlined, is because we were concerned that if we looked at only at those youth that were successfully released from probation, we'd be guilty of really cherry picking, right? Because we're just looking at, therefore, the most successful youth, the best, the cream of the crop, if you will. And so uh, while we wanted to stay true to the Nebraska Supreme Court definition, um, as you'll see in a few slides later, we looked at not only successful youth, but we looked at youth that were unsuccessful in completing probation in, um, in our analysis and asked what were the recidivism rates uh, they completed but unsuccessfully, what were the recidivism rates um, for those youth as well. Okay, so this is a bigger database. This has 14,116 youth discharged between 2010 uh, through 2015 in this study um, that we analyzed. The data, once again, was provided to us by uh, Nebraska Probation uh, from their data files. And just to give you an idea of what this sample looks like, the age at first YLS administration is, again, the mean about 15.99, the median is 16, the age of discharge is 16.99, the median is 17. So these are kids that have roughly been in probation uh, for about a year, which is the average stay. Um, that should hopefully ring true to you in terms of what the average child does while they're on probation. Once again, this is, again, 65% males, boys, and about 35, 36% um, girls in the sample. Very comparable to our sample for the YLS study. Okay. Um, and uh, this is the uh, same breakdown of race and ethnicity, which is also comparable to the YLS study. The majority here, a little higher majority of the youth were white. Here in this sample, uh, there's a few more Hispanic Latino youth and there were African-American youth, but roughly the same uh, totals in comparison to the study looking at the YLS. And so we got a pretty representative sample of youth in, um, that we're looking at. And that's important because we want to be able to say something about uh, the recidivism rate across the youth in the state. So here's it is. Recidivism rate for probationers. This is successfully discharged. Those that were successfully discharged uh, in probation for the full sample by that Nebraska Supreme Court definition is 25.9 or a little under 26 percent, right? Um, which is favorable compared to the 33 percent that was found in the Midwest State study. Uh, once again, 
we have to be careful about comparing across jurisdictions. But that's the rate that we got for those 14,000 youth um, for those that were successfully discharged. However, once again, um, there is an issue of looking at youth who are successfully discharged and comparing them to all youth that went through probation. Because once again, the youth who are successfully discharged are probably going to be the ones that are uh, more likely to do well. And so you can see on the far right, we have um, successfully discharged youth each year. And then on the left, we have all probationers. The red bar is their first occurrence, their first time through probation. Unfortunately, um, as you probably know, uh, children come back a second and third time sometimes. The blue bar is the second occurrence, and the gray bar is the third occurrence. So you can see <coughs> where the 25.9% recidivism rate comes from uh, on the right side. Uh, those are successful youth, uh, first time, first occurrence through probation. And then you can see on the left side, for all probationers, including the successful and the unsuccessful, um, and those that were revoked, that in fact, um, the recidivism rate is, is higher. It's almost 30%, but still pretty low. Still, still uh, actually lower than the 33% benchmark that I set up or showed you earlier in an earlier slide. That's one important thing to get out of this slide. Probably equally important is to, to notice that the real um, driver in this relationship is, is not so much the difference between successful and unsuccessful as it is how many times the youth went through probation. And you can see as the number of times going through probation increases from the first to the second to the third, there's a large increase in the probability of, uh, of recidivism for those youth moving up that scale. And so that suggests to us that we really need to be um, trying to understand and identify which youth are going to come back and, and try to prevent that from happening. So um, recidivism rates over time, as I mentioned earlier, might be a better indicator and a more important indicator of uh, the success of the R&R &R model because now we're not comparing between jurisdictions, but we're comparing it within a jurisdiction. And so here's the data from 2010 to 2015, yearly rates of recidivism among successfully discharged youth. This is just successful youth. The report um, that's on the right side of the screen uh, has this data broken down for a variety of different of successful and unsuccessful youth. But for successful youth, using the Nebraska uh, Supreme Court definition, you can see that there is a slow but steady decrease from 28.5% um, percent of recidivism in 2010 to 24.9% in 2015. And that difference between 2015 and 2010 is, in fact, a significant drop uh, from when we started looking at that data to when we, we finished in 2015. 2016 and 2017 data are not in this slide, in part because we need a year of time to calculate the recidivism rates. And you can see also that 2013, when the legislature expanded jurisdiction uh, over um, a youth in the juvenile justice system to probation, um, that expansion had almost no impact in the difference in rates of recidivism. So that's a, that's a pretty interesting and important slide because it could be going up, it could be going level, but we have it actually showing a slight decrease at least from those five years that we have data from. Um, next question I want to briefly talk about is does the YLS-CMI predict recidivism using the Nebraska Supreme Court definition? Our first study looked at the prediction of the YLS uh, for uh, data talking about um, failure as returning to probation or failing in probation, what about recidivism? So that's a, an, another test of the, of the YLS and probably an equally important one. And so we looked at some data that looked at, and it's shown here in this, in this slide that's um, on the screen, uh, looking at uh, the prediction or the predictability of the YLS, uh, talking about recidivism as defined by the Nebraska Supreme Court, but here for successful, unsuccessful completers and revoked youth. So if you look at the far left-hand column, you can see, again, we're looking at low, moderate, high, moderate, high, and very high. And the far right-hand column, we're looking at the recidivism rate. And it shows that familiar step function, which is significant, um, that as the youth become higher on their risk scores on the YLS, their likelihood, their probability of recidivism increases across that measure. So that's exactly the function that we're hoping to find and what we're looking for. And there's a few other things I want to, I want to point out. 
One is, do youth demonstrate lower risk after probation? And so now, um, in order to say that probation causes a drop in a lowering of uh, youth risk, we have to have a comparison group that we don't have. Um, but we can ask the question, is there a change in risk level over probation that's consistent with a uh, positive change or, uh, in, in youth rehabilitation or a negative change in recidivism? So what this, side, this slide has um, is uh, it looks at the risk level for probation occurrence for the first score uh, compared to the last score before discharge for these 6,159 youth. And you can see that there is a significantly different decrease from 12.96, almost 13, to down about to 12, uh, just about one point um, on, from the pretest to the post-test score um, in, um, uh, on, the, on the YLS CMI. So that's a positive finding. Um, okay, so let me tell you about the take-home points from the second study, and then in the time that's left, we'll see if we have questions that I can answer for you. First of all, the overall juvenile recidivism rate of youth successfully released from probation using the Nebraska, excuse me, the Nebraska Supreme Court definition is 24.9 percent, which is which is uh, well within what we would hope it to be. Secondly, recidivism decreased from 2010 to 2015. Third, the YLS CMI successfully predicts recidivism defined by the Nebraska Supreme Court. And four, the youth who leave probation are lower in risk than when they entered probation. So those are very very positive findings. Other lessons that we can take from the R&R &R model that are not part of this study, but that um, are important to point out from the literature in general, is that matching treatment with risk level produces the best result. This is a critically important concept to understand that's been, that's been shown in study after study. Overtreating youth, offering them services, more services than is justified by their level of risk, actually increases recidivism. And undertreating youth, offering too few services that's needed at their level of risk, also increases recidivism. So the goal is to match the level of risk with the level of needed intervention. And of course, in order to do that, we need to have an instrument like the YLS that does an accurate job of predicting risk. What else can we learn from the R&R &R model in the research literature? First of all, providers of treatment should be qualified to offer the treatment for the best results. There's a meta-analysis that's been done uh, by a fellow named of Leipzig in, um, in Vanderbilt uh, that looked at Oh, the sound went off. Well. I mean, how far back? Okay. Um, other lessons that we learned from the R and R model. Um, is again that providers of treatment should be qualified to offer the treatments uh, for the best results possible. There was a meta-analysis done by Leipzig uh, that looked at, I think it was 529 studies over a long year period of time, and it showed that one of the best predictors of success was how well qualified the treatment providers were. Secondly, um, treatment should be evidence-based, and that it should demonstrate, that means that we, have to, we should have data that shows the treatments actually work, and demonstrate fidelity to the treatment model that produced the, um, the results in the first place. It should follow the treatment model. Thirdly, treatment dosage should be high enough in terms of both frequency and duration to have um, significant effects. Um, and so we want to make sure that youth are in treatment for a long enough period of time. Other points that I want to draw from the R&R &R model is first that there is a lot of evidence, one study being Tillerall recently in 2017, that shows that punitive climate produces aggressive behavior in youth. Youth who are in open and semi-structured institutions who perceive the climate more positively show less regression um, as opposed to those that perceive the climate as being aggressive or perceive it less positively. And perhaps most importantly, the longer youth stay in residential care like detention, the more aggression they, they will ultimately, uh, ultimately show. And then one more study I want to point out, or one more finding from the R&R &R model, uh, is that uh, punitive climate produces mental health symptoms in youth. And there's a number of studies that show this. The most recent one that I found is Yoder, Whitaker, and Quinn in 2017 that studied 7,073 youth housed in correctional facilities uh, and that is likely, for example, detention. And it showed that traumatic events um, that result even for short stays in these facilities 
uh, were predictive of resulted in increased mental health problems. So there's a lot we can learn, I think, both from this study um, that I talked about as well as from the general literature pertaining to uh, lessons from the um, R and R model um, that we can that we can glean from our research. And so that's about all I have to say on these two studies. I think there's about 10 minutes left, so I will be happy to take any questions that you have. I guess the way to ask a question is to type it into the chat box, and it should appear for me, um, and I'll see if I can answer it for you. Okay, do I have any research on uh, FAS and probation? Well, um, there is data that I haven't analyzed, but there's data on FAS and probation. I don't have it, and I haven't done that analysis, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to say that I can't really say much about, about that, uh, given the data that we've analyzed. But I'll be happy to answer any other questions you might have. Someone is typing. Thank you. You're welcome for giving you no answer. <laughs> what else? I'm waiting. Awesome work. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, what else? you separate out sexual offenses versus non-sexual offenses. So we have the data to do that, and that's in fact one of the future plans that we're hoping to look at. In this particular study that I talked about, we did not um, separate them out, uh, but that is a possibility, and we have the data to do that, and um, in fact, that's probably gonna be one of the analyses that we do next with this, with this set of data and some future sets of data. Great question, I can't really answer it yet. Uh, if detaining low risk makes youth, if detaining low risk youth makes things worse, why do we still do this? I wish I could answer that question. <laughs> That's a difficult question to answer. It's a great question to pose. It seems for me that if you look at the literature, and not just in our studies, but in all the studies that have been done, the chief problem that we have, or one of the main problems that we have, is trying to get that match correct, right? And so. Um, you know, sometimes it might like, make you feel better to be able to say that we've administered a high level of treatment uh, to youth, or it might make you think that you're covering all your bases. But the truth is, is that if you actually mismatch that risk level to that intervention level, you wind up doing more harm than good. So I'm not, I can't answer why we do it. All I can tell you is we surely should not do it, and we should stop doing it um, if, 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 if any way that we possibly can. Um, I do realize that there are issues with respect to what do we do with youth that are difficult to control and so on, but there's a lot other techniques that are evidence-based that are available um, that will help uh, um, service providers and practitioners deal with difficult youth besides detaining them, and we need to focus more on those and train on those and use those more than, um, more than the ones that we, more than detain them. No statistical questions, huh? I'm so surprised. <laughs> what else can I can I answer about this work or or any other work related to this? Either I'm very clear or uh, I'm not very clear at all, and you can't ask a question. I'm not sure which it is, but I'll stay on the line here for a few more minutes in case somebody thinks of something and wants to ask it. While we're waiting, I did want to mention, I uh, apologize for the audio going out. Uh, however, I do have a backup audio recording. So when we post the recording of this webinar, that uh, uh, dead space will be uh, remedied. Thank you. 
Um, I probably, maybe I didn't. Uh, where is it? It's it's on the beginning of the chapter. Oh, this is it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So for anybody that's interested in CLE credit, uh, the CLE number is 163890. I believe it was posted at the beginning of the, of the presentation as well. In the chat box. In the chat box. Oh, I have another question. Um, is it beneficial for the youth for probation to share with the treatment provider to have the, well, the YLS result? Well... Um, I think it's beneficial for anybody who's going to be working with the youth to have information upon the risk level. There may be ways to present that information that do or do not include the YLS score. It certainly would be beneficial for anybody who's working with the youth to have some idea at what level of risk that youth, that youth measures out at. Here's another question. Is there any indication that detaining youth who run away makes youth less likely to run in the future? I think the most we know about detaining youth um, is that what it mostly does is it makes them angrier, it makes them a bit more hostile, and it makes them sometimes, if, it's, if they're detained in a situation that's uh, uh, not conducive to their health, it can, make, it can increase their mental health problems. I don't know any research that supports the proposition that detainment is a deterrent to future running away. Um, is there criminogenic hours for this session? I'm afraid I'm just told that we did not submit those, so uh, I guess, but but we'll check, and um, and I think we have your name, so we'll be able to get back to you on that. Um, can you elaborate on how the YLS is equally valid for boys and girls, but boys show a higher likelihood to fail return to probation? That's an excellent question, and I can't elaborate on that. This is really the difference between what in research we call a main effect, which shows that boys and girls score differently, versus an interaction, which asks the question, does the effect of the YLS depend upon gender? That is, does the prediction curve, that step function, is it different for boys than it is for girls? So we're aware of the fact that boys do score higher um, on likelihood to return to probation or failure than girls do, and there's lots of literature that, that would support that. But the critical issue here is can we predict that differently with the YLS for boys and for girls? If the YLS makes a different prediction, if that function that steps that, we, that I showed you earlier is different or has a different slope, if you will, it's gradual for one and not gradual for the other, or reverses directions for one or for the other, that's a serious issue because that actually means that the instrument is predicting differently for boys than it is for girls. It doesn't do that. It predicts the same for boys and for girls, but we don't have an interaction, if you will, but we have a main effect. So boys are elevated at each of those steps, but the step function follows suit for both boys and girls. So that's the answer to that question. I hope that helped. Um, and I tried to present that in the slide, and it's also discussed in great detail in either one of the two papers that you, or the papers that you could download that are on the right of the screen. A couple minutes left if anybody else has any questions. Um, it was a pleasure talking to, you, talking to you this afternoon about our research, what we've done, what we found, and sharing with you some ideas um, about what we've, what we've learned and uh, future steps for understanding um, the YLS and recidivism in Nebraska probation. So with that, I think I'm going to try to figure out how to turn this off. Um, and let's see where we're at. Here. Thank you. Thank you.